<clears throat> Hi there, my name is Matt Wallace. I'm a producer and I'm working with the Revelries on their album. And you're watching the Edge Out uh, YouTube uh, channel. Uh, I got my uh, start in the music business uh, many years ago when I was 13 and I was always in bands and uh, I was the nerdy guy that uh, would kind of record our stuff back in the old days on cassettes and I built a bunch of recording gear and eventually built a recording studio in my parents' garage. And while going to uh, college uh, to be an English teacher, I ended up recording a bunch of bands in my, in my parents' garage and, and things kind of just took off from there. So then I moved my studio to Oakland and then moved down to LA. So I kind of started with a band called Faith No More in my parents' garage that we were kind of started there. So we kind of grew up together. They had some success. And so I uh, did as much as I could in the Bay Area. And then I moved down to LA. You know, establishing your rep reputation as someone in the music business is really, really difficult. Uh, my first like eight to 10 years, I just starved. I, I you know, had a one bedroom apartment. My friend John slept in the living room and I slept in the bedroom. And, you know, even that was a struggle to come up with that kind of rent. Because uh, when I started, I was charging like $12 an hour for like eight track recording way back when. And so it was really hard to make a living at it. Um, but you just keep at it like any business that where it's, uh, you're in the entertainment business where people really want those jobs. You have to work extra, extra hard and, you know, have, you have to work long, long hours. And, you know, it, I had to give up a lot of fun that my friends were having they could have like regular lives but i was always just like grinding to make this happen so it was really tough it got to a point where i just did enough demos for bands in the bay area that ultimately got signed in la and then they would work with somebody else and i was like ah i'm tired of that so i just moved to la i figured well i'm just gonna make this happen because otherwise I'm gonna, i was gonna just go into teaching or something else because <clears throat> just wasn't very viable you know to make any money at it so but it, you have to be really ready to work really super long hours The biggest challenge as a producer is that the entire business has changed since I started. When I started, you had to have a recording studio to make records. Uh, people did want producers and engineers and things like that, people who are professional to be involved. And, um, and now that you can make records in your bedroom, you can do it on a computer, you can do it with programming, you don't really need producers so much anymore. So the good news is that you don't need that to, to make your art, which is really, really great, but it does mean that there's fewer jobs for people like me. Um, and the, also budgets come down quite a bit because they go, well, we can make this thing for nothing on our computer. So there's a, that challenge. Yeah, and, uh, and also there's so much music out there now. There's so much music, it's really hard to get heard. I think the last statistic I heard is that Spotify gets somewhere between, I think it's 20 and 40,000 songs a day. Yeah. So then how do you find music anymore? Like at least in the old days, the major labels kind of fed us, like here's the, the cool bands. And that was good and bad, and now it's like, Everything's out there, and you can find all the music all over the place. But it's it's hard to figure out what to listen to. But yeah, so I mean, that's a challenge. It's, it's a challenge to still be viable and make a living when you know, budgets are smaller and things like that. It's a good question. I think anyone who says they know a record's going to be a hit, I don't think is being completely honest because it's so hard to tell what is going to be a hit. Yes, record labels can put a lot of money into. Uh, certain songs and certain artists and push them forward, but sometimes things come out of nowhere and become hits anyway. Uh, for me, my, my biggest long shot actually was uh, the first Maroon 5 record. They were signed to Octone, which was an unknown label. They had never put out any music, unknown band. I was offered twice as much money to work on a record on Columbia Records, but I heard the music on Maroon 5 and I just said, these songs are so good that if nobody blows it, this is gonna be huge. So I took a huge pay cut and really just dug in deep to really make the, the best record I could and hope for the best and I was really lucky because really on paper that record should have never ever been heard by anybody because it was an indie label so yeah. but it, it worked out. It's really interesting because I built this place this is basically supposed to be like a living room with instruments and I wanted it to be a place where it just felt really natural like because like you know, before COVID, I had two couches in here. Everyone kind of just hung out here, but I had to move one out trying to not have too many people in the room. But it's really supposed to be a really uh, relaxed kind of creative space where you can almost imagine anything happening. And it's like we're all just hanging out, talking about songs, and we just happen to have recording gear here. And to me, the whole idea was to make it almost seamless to go from kind of creation and the genesis of an idea to actually capturing it. And it was really just to make it just like, like I said, a living room with instruments and everyone can just re relax. And I just tell people when they were working together, I said, just think of this as your place and do whatever you want. You never have, ask, have to ask questions like, can I do this? That's like, yeah, just hang out and do your thing. This is your spot. You should feel really, really safe and comfortable to try everything and anything. 
because we have this huge safety net that if it doesn't sound good or it sucks, we just won't put it out. But I want people to be open to doing their best. Also, if you're open to falling flat on your face, you'll be really open to doing great stuff. Because I did a good decade of like really nice records like within the confines of our little cubicles and and, and they're always like just fine, but I, I learned I had to really push hard and be re willing to really do the wrong thing so you do the right thing. And back to Maroon 5, we actually cut that record and we actually made an urban record and, and we went way off track and we came back to where we started. And sometimes you go on a journey and you'll find a better place or where you're supposed to be musically. Uh, and sometimes you go all the way around the block and you come back to where you started and you realize that's the right spot. And that's, those are important journeys. Questions? That's a really good question, actually. Um, I think the biggest, the most important thing to, to uh, strive for in any relationship, whether it's working with the band or the label, is to be respectful of what they have to say. That's the very first thing. And yeah. I think that almost everybody on the planet just wants to be heard. And if you listen to them first and foremost, and take in what they're saying, and go, okay, I hear what you're saying, let me think about it, and let me reflect on it, let's see if that applies to what we're trying to do. That's honestly, it took me a long time to figure that out because in the olden days, like when I'd be working with a band or something like that, and someone make a suggestion, we would argue for an hour about whether or not an idea would work. And it would really take us five minutes to try it. And to me, I just figured, let's just take the argument out of the process. Let's just try it and go, hmm, you know. And usually if an idea is kind of not that good, the person who suggested it, if it's not good, they're usually the first person to say, ah, that doesn't sound very good. But so I think the idea is to be really open to trying things and listen to what the band members have to say, listen to what the label has to say, take it in, respectfully understand it, and, take, and, and see what they're trying to get at, and then, and then give it a try. And sometimes what people are saying isn't even what they mean, and that's really the difficult part of the process is to hear them and go, okay, I, I know they're saying this one thing, but I think there's something behind that, and to try to be able to suss out what it is that they exactly, what they truly want. And so to me, it's just all about hearing people and listening. That's it. I mean, it's really, really easy. And not being defensive and having to like defend your position or explain why it doesn't work. Go, just go, I hear what you're saying. And that's a good, good idea, good perspective. Let's see if it fits what we're trying to accomplish. And that to me is the biggest thing. You know, it's really uh, the most important thing, I think. Because you're just dealing with, it, with other people, people in bands, people at labels. Everyone has their. And I think the biggest lesson in working in the music business, also in real life, is being sensitive to other people's sensitivities. If you're aware of that's what's happening, then you can just be kind of a little gentle in certain areas and, and just be empathetic and be compassionate and go, okay, I hear what you're saying, but let, let's let's try this other idea here, you know. Uh, anyway, that's the thing, just being sensitive, especially when you're working with artists. Artists are very sensitive people. People at record labels are sensitive people. Everyone has their things that they, that's their sore spot or their tender areas that you just have to kind of go, okay, you know. And, and if you can appreciate that, then you can almost be, be on their team to get them what they want. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. the thing. I think, I think it's all about collaboration and teamwork for me. Oh, that's a tough one to answer because uh, there's so many records I listen back after I haven't heard them in a while that, that, uh, that I really like. Okay, uh, uh, there's a band called Weapon of Choice that was out like 18, 20 years ago and they were really, really good and they actually wrote a song right after the Rodney King verdict and there was still writing going on and that record and those guys opened my mind to the black perspective and it's also the the easiest record to shake my butt to. Uh, <laughs> the, the Maroon 5 record, because it was, uh, it's like, I don't know, like 15 million sold worldwide, and, and, and obviously that was a, a big success uh, creatively and financially. There's a band called Faith No More, their breakthrough record. They kind of brought like rap metal to the forefront and got to like number eight on the, on the radio. Um, I mean, those are just some of those off the top of my head. So I'm, I'm sure there, there are other ones, but that's all I can think of like right now. 